Wonderland. All right. Thank you all for joining. Um, yeah, this talk is called Mind Altering Mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest. And uh, just as a disclaimer, KPMS is not trying to promote any use of these or anything like that. This is purely educational. So um, if you're ever curious about these kind of mushrooms, they do occur here in the Pacific Northwest. And so I'm going to talk about them here today. Uh, who am I? My name is Aaron Hilliard. I'm the Vice President of Kitsap Peninsula Mycological Society, and I have a YouTube channel called Mushroom Wonderland. You might have seen me there on Instagram or TikTok, and I make all kinds of foraging videos. And due to the policies of YouTube, I don't talk too much about psilocybin mushrooms because they have a tendency to close people's channels for talking about that. And so, um, and, and I, I like to keep it family friendly and whatnot, you know, and so again, I'm not... I'm just, this is purely educational, and uh, and I do have experience with these mushrooms, not in a long time, but I, you know, I've been to the mountaintop, so to speak, so I don't really feel the need to go back right away. But um, so that's who I am. I've been picking mushrooms and coming to this show since I was a kid, and my grandma got me into it. And then when I was a teenager, I got a new love for mushrooms, and uh, because of these kind of mushrooms, you know, and so. Uh, I'm going to go way back. This is more than the PNW, the earliest known uses. Um, there's, there's drawings on, a, on cave walls in Tanzania down in Australia from 10,000 years ago, and these people are said to represent magic mushrooms. You can see their uh, crazy mushroom-looking hairdos. Um, you know, there's some scholars that debate that, and they say that these are probably trees, but uh, for, for my sake, I think it's interesting, 10,000 years ago, people were were uh, drawing mushrooms on walls. And in Central America, there's evidence of people using magic mushrooms 5,000 years ago. In Spain, there's um, there's these uh, paintings on the walls. Uh, the Selva Pascualala mural from 6,000 years ago. And it seems to depict something called Psilocybe Hispanica, which is a magic mushroom that grows in Spain. And I guess they can tell that because the, the stems on some of them are crooked and they just looked at this, the cap to stem ratio and kind of figured like this has to be, you know, those certain mushrooms. Uh, Psilocybe hispanica has kind of a crooked stem sometimes. So just like you see in those pictures there. So that's interesting. A different mind altering mushroom. This is a, a fresco uh, painted in a, you know, in a church in, in 1291 in France. And this depicts uh, Adam and Eve. And instead of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they're standing in, uh, around an Amanita muscaria. So the very, um, very uh, you know, recognizable mushroom, red with the white, white dots all over the cap. And then uh, instead of leaves, you know, they're covering themselves with mushroom caps. And so some people would think that maybe, um, maybe it wasn't uh, a piece of fruit, but more of a mushroom that gave and then the knowledge, you know. Um, this mushroom I was just talking about, Amanita muscaria. There's a lot of stories about, um, it's kind of folklore stories about ancient um, shamans in northern Siberia, and in particular a place called Lapland in Finland, which is a, a, a really far north Arctic uh, kind of conifer forest land where it snows a lot in the winter, and the only thing that really grows out there are these Amanita muscarias. And, uh, and, uh, and so the story of Saint Nick, uh, you know, some people believe actually comes from Amanita muscaria, and these people lived in these little cabins in Lapland, and it would snow so much that they couldn't open their front door, so the shaman would come to town, and he would have to go down the chimney with his gifts of magic mushrooms that people ate, and then they saw visions, and than the, uh, the reindeer, because they actually had sleds that they pulled by reindeer way up there, and so they would appear to fly or whatever, you know, and so they wore, you know, fur suits, a lot like what Santa Claus wears, so I don't know, you be the judge, but it seems to make a lot of sense if you think about that. Uh, so I'll make the distinction, uh, Amanita versus psilocybin mushroom, so Amanita here on top, the, the common, you know, red with the white spots, and this is another Amanita that's kind of closely related. Amanita pantheranoides here in the Northwest is the brown one with the white spots. 
And this, um, a lot of people confuse that mushroom with a magic mushroom. A lot of times when they talk about magic mushrooms, that picture will be, you know, on a t-shirt or on a, mo a poster or whatever. And it's actually a sedative hypnotic and a depressant. And it has more of an effect of like making you feel disassociated and confused and drunk. A lot of people, after they've eaten them, will go lay down and have like terrible, horrible dreams. There's a reason why those mushrooms are psychoactive, but they're not illegal, is because the effects are so unpleasant that people just won't do it a second time. <laughs> and they also, uh, you know, they contain a couple of compounds called uh, muscamol and iobotanic acid, which work together to give you these kind of delirium effects, but they also contain something called muscarin, which um, is poisonous and, it'll, and it can give you really bad abdominal cramps, vomiting, diarrhea, so. Any um, field guide that you read is going to tell you that the Amanita muscaria and pantherinoides um, are toxic and would, would suggest that you don't eat them. Some people detoxify them and you can do that by boiling them in water and then, and then you know, sauteing them after that and people eat them. And uh, they say they're good. It seems like a lot of trouble to go to. You could just eat any other mushroom that's safe, you know. So psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, these are the ones on the bottom. They're typically what we call an LBM, so a little brown mushroom uh, is usually, especially here in the Northwest, they're all little brown mushrooms. And so they don't have this glittery red with the white spots all over it. They're gonna be a lot less conspicuous. And uh, so these are a psychedelic hallucinogen when people talk about um, magic mushrooms. This is usually what they're referring to, not so much the amanitas but the psilocybin mushrooms. Over 250 species of these exist worldwide. And here in the Northwest, we have like 12 or 13 that occur here and not even native, but they occur. And I'm gonna be talking about all those today. Um, this is kind of a fun story. Uh, the first medical uh, reports of psilocybin mushrooms uh, we're in 1799 in a London medical journal where a father had gone to Green Park, that's this place here in London, still exists and people play there today, and he foraged some wild mushrooms and he went home and he made stew for his family, because I guess you have stew in the morning in London in 1799, and, uh, and so he fed everybody a bowl of this stew and uh, they all started to uh, experience some really weird feelings, you know? And so they ate the stew at about 9 a.m. and then they called the apothecary, which is like the doctor of the time, at about 10 a.m. and said, uh, we got trouble going on over here, I don't know, we're all freaking out or whatever. And so this doctor goes there to observe this family. And so it was a dad and his four kids. And uh, so they ate this stew and the apothecary he described what happened then. He said, Edward, one of the children, eight years old, who had eaten a large proportion of the mushrooms, as they thought them, was attacked with fits of a moderate laughter. Uh, as, uh, nor could the threats of his father or mother refrain him. So it's kind of weird. They were like, stop laughing. And he's like, <laughs> to this succeeded vertigo and a great deal of stupor from which he was roused by being called or shaken, but immediately relapsed. He sometimes pressed his hands on different parts of his abdomen as if in pain, but when roused and interrogated as to it, he answered indifferently, yes or no, as he did to every other question, evidently without any relation to what was asked. About the same time, the father, age 40, was attacked with vertigo and complained that everything appeared black, then wholly disappeared. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> to, to this succeeded loss of voluntary motion and stupor. His pupils were di dilated and his pulse was slow. And uh, I actually read the whole medical account of the, out of this journal, it was super interesting. And he went through all the kids and they were all experiencing similar things. All their eyes were pure black, right? And they were, uh, and they were all having a terrible bad trip. Because if you take psilocybin mushrooms and you don't mean to, it's not gonna be very fun. You're probably gonna be like really surprised with what's happening. And so the dad kept saying, I think I'm dying. And the doctor would go, are you okay? And then he'd go, no, I'm okay. <laughs> and they'd say, but I think I'm dying. And then, no, I'm okay. It went on for like six hours. You know, so. Dad, stew breakfast, so I don't know. <laughs> don't eat the breakfast stew in London, I guess. <laughs> or do, I don't know. So Latin names, Latin is now considered a dead language, meaning that it's, uh, it's used in specific contexts, but it doesn't have any native speakers. So if you're new to mushrooms or like me, I learned out of books, so I was learning by like trying to sound out words, you know, and, uh, and I always said psilocybe, which is okay, but the most accepted in the mycological community is psilocybe, 
because Latin often puts a really hard sound on some of these vowels. So when it ends with an E, like hygrosibe, agrosibe, these are hygrosibe, agrosibe, psilocybe. Uh, but because Latin is a dead language, psilocybe is fine too. Whichever way you want to say it, just say it with confidence. <laughs> so Gordon Wasson, this is a story that has to be told about magic mushrooms. This was a mycologist back in the 40s and uh, 50s, and he was just uh, obsessed with mushrooms. He was a New York banker, but he got really obsessed with mushrooms, and uh, he traveled the world, not just magic mushrooms, but he wanted to know everything, but he was just a mycologist, and he was good at it, and he had the best of intentions, and then he heard about the story of mushrooms that make you see visions in Mexico, so he took off uh, to go to Mexico, and he met this lady uh, pictured here, Maria Sabina, and she's become famous for introducing Western culture to magic, you know, psilocybe mushrooms. And so she took him on one of these spiritual journeys. They didn't consider it getting high. It was part of their cultural, you know, spiritual, uh, you know, religious type of uh, whatever uh, ceremony. And so um, he got included on it. And so he came back and then went back down there and Life Magazine, one of the, you know, wrote an article about it. He kind of exposed these magic mushrooms to the world. And uh, he had the best of intentions in mind. He really, you know, loved the people of Mexico and stuff. But what happened was a, a lot of hippies jumped in their vans and they stormed down to Mexico and they took over this town and the people were really unhappy that they, all these hippies showed up in town wanting these mushrooms. Kind of exiled Marina Sabina. Eventually she died kind of in poverty and it's sort of a sad story. And Gordon Wasson was uh, kind of villainized for exposing this sacred spiritual thing in the mountains of Mexico. But it brought an awareness of psychedelic mushrooms to America. And it was clearly more than just hocus pocus and superstition. There was something in these mushrooms. And so uh, the first modern discoveries here in the Pacific Northwest, um, this. Uh, this is Evergreen State College, and the guy up in the top left corner, his name is Michael Bugue, and he is a uh, mycologist uh, at, at Evergreen State University. And he, um, let me see if I can find this. So he, uh, he's still very involved in mycology, and he started uh, teaching in 1972. Uh, the doors open at Evergreen State University. He became a professor in 1972 of mycology there. And uh, it was 1975, these other guys that happened to be students of his, a guy named Paul Stamets, which a lot of you have probably heard of. He does TED Talks and he's really famous for his magic mushroom talks. Jeremy Bigwood, Jonathan Ott, these guys are all have wrote really famous books about mycology. I happen to know Michael Buke and he was a guest in our club meeting. So if you're not a, a club member for KPMS, we have some super cool guests and he came and gave us a talk all about, uh, not even about magic mushrooms, but he was, uh, I was texting with him about this subject. You know, when did the mushroom, when did we discover them here in the Northwest? And what he said is in 1975, when Paul Stamens, Jeremy Bigwood and Jonathan Ott arrived at my office wanting to study mushrooms, I'd never heard of psilocybin or psilocybe containing mushrooms in the uh, Pacific Northwest. No previous student had ever mentioned them. The only mind-altering mushrooms I was aware of were Amanita muscaria and the Pantherina. Those were the names used in that day. They had Wasson Soma. They'd heard about Wasson's trip down to Mexico. And so they started analyzing a wide range of mushrooms for uh, psilocybin content. Jonathan Ott and Paul Stamets were soon naming some of the new species they discovered. Students started hunting for uh, Psilocybe similancieta or Liberty Caps. They were probably introduced from Europe at some point, um, but all of a sudden the mayor was calling Michael Bugue's office saying, what are these students doing out in my lawn, crawling around the nearby penitentiary? Um, the, the inmates were out on their hands and knees picking mushrooms out of the grass. So the, the magic mushroom movement in the Pacific Northwest was in full swing there, thanks to these names. And uh, so, um, you know, a lot, they, the mushrooms have always been here, just people didn't really know about it, you know, until these guys kind of started to expose it. And Paul Stamets has really made it, really made it famous. So um, really cool, Michael Bew gives a talk about all about, uh, all about the psilocybin mushrooms and stuff. So I'm just gonna go into describing some of these mushrooms for you. Um, this one, Amanita muscaria and pantheranoides. So Amanita muscaria is actually a European taxonomy. And here in America, we just adopted it because it's easy to just call it that. 
It's red with these white speckles. Here in the Northwest, we have a different variety called Flabby Volvata, and it's got a little yellow, a little bit of yellowishness around the, um, around the rings on the vulva, which is the bulbous base. And so like I already explained, these aren't your typical magic mushrooms, but to fit into a talk called Mind Altering Mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest, it would be incomplete without talking about these mushrooms. So they're beautiful, but I think they should probably be avoided unless you kind of know what you're doing. I don't know, like I said, people don't usually do them a second time. So, um, but they will alter your mind. Um, then Psilocybe Simulancieta, this one is known as the Liberty Cap. Um, and it's the genus type for psilocybe. So all psilocybin mushrooms follow um, the standard set by, the, by this mushroom. And it's definitely a LBM, a little brown mushroom. And it often grows on well decomposed cow manure. And one of my earliest memories, I remember driving with my mom and her boyfriend and I remember going by this cow field and all these people were out there with like Safeway bags and they were crouching around. And I remember being like, what are they doing out there? And he goes, they're looking for magic mushrooms. And I remember just being like, that sounds awesome. You know? I was like eight, I don't know. Um, but you know, I grew up in a farming community and I, like I said, I got into this stuff when I was a teenager and I scoured the fields day and night looking in cow patties to no avail and never found any liberty caps they seem to be super elusive and some people seem to find them and i had friends that had found them and they are extremely powerful small little mushrooms and they don't do a lot of bruising so i'll get into talking about that but that's one of the morphological features of psilocybin mushrooms is that they they uh, bruise blue not all mushrooms that bruise blue are hallucinogenic but all of these that are hallucinogenic, do the roots blue. Um, so lots of be cyan essence. Oh, and, and the Semolanciata probably introduced, as Michael Bug said, from the UK. So this is the same mushroom that that old guy fed to his family for stew in the morning. Very powerful, small mushrooms in it. And uh, so yeah. So lots of be cyan essence, the wavy cap. These pictures were taken in Port Orchard, Washington, just a couple of years ago. And you can see they're pretty slimy, really caramel colored, and they get a feature that's called hygrophanius. So as they kind of dry out, they'll get a lighter color in the center, and then they, and, uh, and but they'll rehydrate when it rains again, then they get dark and dark caramel brown again. And so definitely an LBM. These mushrooms like to grow under um, like rhododendrons. They love to grow in beauty bark. Uh, they love to grow around police stations and courthouses. You know? <laughs> um, but the good thing is, you know, most police are not mushroom experts, so they don't know what you have if you're collecting those. Um, they're called the wavy cap because the margin or the edge of the cap gets a real wavy look to it as they mature. And uh, they also bruise blue. Um, and you can find these in great numbers. Uh, we used to find them in Tacoma when I was a teenager, and some of them get really big. You know, we found some that had caps over three or four inches around sometimes. It's pretty crazy. But um, this one is called Psilocybe azurescens. This one occurs mainly on the coast, uh, coastal Washington and down into northern parts of Oregon, uh, growing in the dune grass, as you can see here. My friend Alan Rockefeller took these photos. They have a very umbinant cap, so it's got a really, really abrupt point on the center of the cap. Again, these will bruise blue, and uh, you can really see it right here on the cap. And that bruising, that probably actually happened from a raindrop hitting it. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a chemical reaction when psilocybin uh, metabolizes or uh, polymerates into psilocin, and, and uh, it actually degrades the hallucinogenic effect when it turns blue. But. Um, but it's definitely a good indicator. So down at like Fort Stevens in, in Oregon is a, is a famously known place where people on their hippie buses, once again, flock to the coast and they're combing the beaches and the dune grass and the police are onto it and people get arrested every year for uh, picking these. And, and these are um, among the most powerful magic mushrooms in the world. So they do occur here. They're said to be import imported from somewhere else too. So. Interesting enough. Um, Psilocybe stuntii. Uh, this one's known as the Blue Ringer. So this is my friend Alan Rockefeller taking pictures of these particular mushrooms in Gig Harbor, Washington last year. And they seem to be a little bit rare now. 
It's called a blue ringer because, again, it's another LBM. It's a little brown mushroom. These like to grow in grass oftentimes, mm -hmm. and uh, they also grow in wood chips. But the way that the cap tears away from the stem when they start to mature, it leaves a little ring on the stem, and that, that little action of tearing away will bruise that little ring so it, it, the ring is blue. That's how they get the name, the blue ringer. And in the mid-90s, that's when I got introduced uh, personally to magic mushrooms, and all these new tract homes went in in Port Orchard, uh, like Glenwood Station and Creekside, and those ones in particular, I remember somebody saying, yeah, the grass up there. And we'd go up there, and I mean, you just, just, I mean, the patches were thicker than the grass of these mushrooms. The sod that they laid down came pre-inoculated with the mushrooms, and they just exploded. And the whole town was covered in blue ringers, right? And so it was like 1995, 1996, and uh, everybody was out of their mind, just running around. People were mad because there was constantly kids in their yards with flashlights at night, you know? And I was one of them. But it was, uh, we weren't trying to harm anybody. We just wanted the mushrooms, you know what I mean? Usually picking them and putting them in our hats. And all the field guides are going to describe Psilocybe stensii as a mild species, but that wasn't my experience. But then, <laughs> but then again, you know, we were collecting pounds of them. I mean, packing our hats full and make a batch of tea that was like four cups, you know, and then we would just lose our minds all night long. So, uh, this one, Psilocybe baeocystis, common name bluebells. So this one is w way less common. I use an app called iNaturalist, and it will tell you what kind of species have occurred in what areas. And this one's been observed only six times in Washington State. Um, but also on Wikipedia, it says that it's common. So I don't know. I've never seen them in, in real life. Again, Alan Rockefeller took this picture, and they really stain blue. And they like to grow in wood chips, and they can grow right amongst the other ones, like the um, stunsi eye or the cyanescence. They'll grow with them too. Another bluebell, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, another LBM. And you can really see all the, the waviness on the margin really kind of sets these ones apart. And they really do turn blue a lot. And a very powerful one, too, from what I hear. Um, this one, Psilocybe ovoidiocystidiata. Uh, people call them ovoids. It's kind of a mouthful to say ovoidiocystidiata, but it, that name is based on morphological features in the microscopy. So. It's kind of describing the ovoid cystidiata, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> these ones were introduced from the East Coast. And these ones, um, one of the videos on my channel is called uh, The Johnny Appleseed of Magic Mushrooms. And this guy goes around and he plants these in all the wood chips and, uh, around here. So, um, and these are one of, the, one of the only ones here in the Northwest that fruit in the spring. So. Most of uh, all the other ones will fruit in the fall, like right now, this is happening. These ones will fruit in the spring and sometimes in the fall also. And so there was a couple of different like phenotypes, but none of them are native. So they're, you know, they're kind of big. Again, if you look at uh, the bottom corner of the left photo, you can really see that blue bruising, really indicative of psilocybin content. And this is a closer up picture of some of the bigger ones. So this guy literally takes five gallon buckets of wood chips that are inoculated with the mycelium of these mushrooms. And then he goes to, and looks for where the county dumps wood chips or whatever and just digs it all in there. And so, I don't know, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna be taking over every wood chip pile in Kitsap County, I think. Um, <laughs> this one, Psilocybe pelliculosa. This one, the conifer psilocybe or the striate psilocybe. This one is probably the only true native to the Pacific Northwest, right here in Washington State. And again, another LBM, but this one isn't gonna grow near road, well, it will grow near rhododendrons, but it's not gonna grow near your beauty bark beds and in your yards. This one grows in the forest. It likes a wild setting. I took the picture, I took both of those pictures actually, uh, last year in Port Orchard. And the one on the left, I, I muted out all the other colors just so you could see how caramel color they are and they look pretty slimy. It was a really rainy day that day. But the stipes on them, the stipe is actually the stem, and these ones are really flocos, so they get this really scaly look on the stem. And they're said to be a pretty mild species. Uh, last year I went to a clear cut. Uh, I was riding my mountain bike out near Green Mountain and came to a clear cut, and I looked down at my feet, and as my eyes unfocused, I looked out, and it was hundreds of thousands of these mushrooms growing in the clear cut. And it's probably like that right now up there, you know? So um, these are 
actually really common. They're really small, and they call it the striate psilocybe. And you can't really see it too well. But right here in this picture, if you could see it, you can see little striations going from the top of the cap to the side, to the end of the margin. And uh, no other psilocybin mushroom really has that morphology. So I kind of like that as a common name as much as I don't really care for common names. The striate psilocybe is a good one because it looks like a mycena except for it's gonna have a dark spore print. Mycenas are all, thousands of these little tiny mushrooms that you see growing in the forest. These can look a lot like those until you take a closer look and you go, oh, okay, these are the, these are sillies. So, um, Psilocybe cubensis. This is the one that you're gonna find in the parking lot of the Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> this is the one that's growing in people's closets. This one has been reported to have shown up in wood chips here in Washington State. I've recently saw pictures where somebody said, what's this growing in the wood chips? Psilocybe cubensis is a mushroom that's uh, from a subtropical region. So it grows in like Texas, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, down south. It grows in cow dung, but it's easily cultivated. It's fairly powerful. And uh, so this is the one that uh, people normally grow and use for medicinal reasons or whatever. Right here on the right is an example of one uh, that's just a crazy, um, just a, you know, an example of all the hybridization and all the breeding that they've done. It doesn't even appear anything like a mushroom. It's just like this big crazy glob of white and blue and all this twisted weird gill formations up on top. But these will weigh like two pounds each, you know, and people are just going crazy uh, breeding these mushrooms. All right, so uh, yeah, Psilocybe cubensis. This one, uh, really unlikely to find, but I just thought, you know, this this one must be talked about because this, if anybody got some at a rock show or something, you know, whatever, uh, it's probably what it was. So common morphological features of Psilocybe mushrooms, blue bruising. So all of these mushrooms bruise blue, and you can really see it in that top picture. It's a, that's actually a scalpel cut a cubensis in half, and you can see all that bluing reaction. And so it's psilocybin that poly polymerizes into psilocin, uh, which is actually psilocin is really what gets you high. Um, the psilocybin kind of gets the limelight, but really it, it doesn't, it's inactive until it's metabolized by things in your brain. Anyways, it's a it's really complicated process, but they all bl uh, bruise blue like that. There's also some types of boletes, and there's even some lexenum, like some birch boletes that are out here that I brought that are bruising blue. It doesn't mean that they're hallucinogenic, but, and it's a totally different chemical process that makes those ones turn blue. Um, another feature that these all share in common, a removable gelatinous pellicle. So you can see in this photo, there's a slimy layer on top of the cap. So if you slowly start to tear the cap apart, you'll be able to see that gelatinous layer hang on until it will finally break. But that was one of the first features that somebody keyed me on to that, that you know, magic mushrooms do that. And I haven't seen many other mushrooms that have that feature at all. So if you have blue bruising and you have that removable gelatinous pellicle, you're probably on the right track. And then the third feature that I think would totally key these out to make them so you know that they're the psilocybin mushroom is a dark purple brown spore print. So all of these mushrooms are gonna have a really dark purple brown spore print and you can find that out by just take a cap of any mushroom, tear the stem off, set the cap down on a white piece of paper and leave it overnight. You can put a glass over it if you want, but it's not necessary. And it will leave a little print there and the dark purple brown spores are pretty indicative. There's a couple of other species that have a dark purple brown spore print, but they're not gonna bruise blue and they're not gonna have that removable gelatinous pellicle. These are a couple of the other uh, mind-altering mushrooms here in the, that grow native in the PNW. Peniolus cinctolus on the left, Peniolus cyanescens on the right. These are dung-loving mushrooms. Sometimes they grow just in lawns that have been fortified with manure in the soil. Um, they're related to the really common Peniolus phonosecchii, which is your lawnmower mushroom, and everybody's lawn probably has those growing in them. They're super duper common, and they also have a really like a jet black spore print. Mm -hmm. um, but these are uh, hallucinogenic. I think the ones on the right, their common name is blue meanies uh, because they also stain blue. Um, any of these psilocybin containing mushrooms bruise blue. And uh, you know, people grow these in their closet sometimes too, but they occur around here. And I've heard it said that they are the most common 
mind-altering mushroom here in the Northwest, even though they look so much like many other LBMs that they're kind of hard to identify, and they don't have that gelatinous pellicle on it, so, and it doesn't have a black, I mean a purple-brown spore print. This one, Foliotina cyanopus. This one, another, look at, look at the bottom, on the left picture, the bottom of the stems are really bluing right there. And once you get to under, once you see what it looks like when a mushroom is blooming, you know, you, you can see it better, even in very small amounts. You can go, oh, there's blue bruising right there. These ones are related to Foliotina rugosa, which is a deadly mushroom that grows here, but it has a really abrupt little ring on the stem. These ones don't have that ring, but still they're related to a family of mushrooms that could kill you. So probably one to avoid. This is for like really advanced mushroomers only. And I haven't ever personally found these, but I have found their cousin, Foliotina rugosa, which is, uh, it, it contains the same compound known as amatoxin that death caps do. So they're small little brown mushrooms that grow in your lawn and if you ate enough of them, you're gonna die one of the most horrible deaths you can imagine. This one, Gymnopilus luteofolius, and these were found in Port Orchard last year. They like to grow on wood chips or rotten logs. I've seen one growing out of a deck railing before. So, <laughs> Gymnopilus, really opportunistic mushrooms, and they just, they'll seek out rotting wood. I've seen a, a landscaping, you know, log that had them growing out of them. And this year, it's weird because each year, some mushrooms do better than others on different years. And this year, a lot of, I, I follow a lot of the Facebook identification forums, and uh, Gymnopilus have been popping up like crazy this year, which is uh, kind of surprising, and it's cool. These are gotta be like the most beautiful of all the mind-altering mushrooms, in my opinion. They've got these uh, really bright orange spores, so when it falls on that ring on the stem, it turns it really bright orange, and it's got really yellow gills. When they're young, they're really furry and purple, and as they get old, they fade to yellow, bright gold. And they've got this beautiful cortina, which is all this webby stuff hanging off the margin right here. So I think they're definitely one of the cooler looking mushrooms. And, and Gymnopilus is a, a family of mushrooms that have several hallucinogenic species that are not um, psilocybin mushrooms. But again, these do bruise blue, but they are mild and extremely, extremely bitter. So I've heard that they're just not worth it. You know, you'll just, if they taste terrible, you'll be burping it up, and uh, it's just not, not really worth it. Um, effects and warnings. Oh, uh, yeah. So, sickness associated with muscarin. So, that's the Amanita. You know, even one reported death in America supposedly attributed to that. But the guy had, like, serious health problems, and uh, so it's hard to say that it was really the mushroom that caused it. But, yeah, there's a reason this mushroom isn't illegal. It causes what seems like drunkenness, tiredness, psychosis, lethargy, and then horrible, horrible nightmares. Um, and then over here, uh, your psilocybin mushrooms. Um, some of the effects, relaxation, euphoria, giddiness, distortion of time, mood swings, intense introspection. Doesn't sound terrible. Uh, spiritual or, or religious experiences. Difficulty differentiating between fantasy and reality. And that part can be dangerous. <laughs> And there have been people who thought they could fly and they jumped off their house or whatever and it didn't end well, you know? So it's, it's a good idea if you're gonna do these to have somebody there that can guide you and be in their right mind, you know, to make sure that, but I think it's very rare that things like that happen. Heightened sensory perception, hallucinations, and synthesia, mixing of senses. I thought that was so cool because it's so true, right? Hearing colors, tasting sounds, and if you've ever, uh, you know, experienced psilocybin mushrooms, you're probably shaking your head a little bit. Like, I know what that feels like, right? Uh, in a bad mind frame, it can cause, in, 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 you know, intense anxiety and fear. But there are no deaths ever been reported to psilocybin mushrooms. There was a guy, 34 years old, who died after eating mushrooms. It was a couple years ago. But when they did toxicology, he had like benzodiazepines, he had opiates, he had alcohol, he had all this other stuff in his system. And of course they wanna like point the finger at mushrooms because he ate mushrooms that night. But I think it was just a huge combination of everything. This guy was like a toxic waste dump. But um, you know, they, they've tested them for uh, addictiveness 
And, uh, and it's interesting, they did a study with rats where they put rats in a cage and they were, there was a lever with the cocaine, right? And the rat would hit it, it would get some cocaine and it would, uh, it would forget about water, it would forget about food, it would forget about mating, it would do nothing but hit the cocaine button. Then they put in a psilocybin button and the rat went over and it hit the button and it got the psilocybin and it never hit that button again. <laughs> Didn't like that. So, you also gain like a really str quick and strong tolerance to psilocybin mushrooms. So if you ate a bunch today and had a really profound experience and you ate the same amount tomorrow, it would be less. If you did it, uh, you know, on Tuesday, you would just have the giggles. Wednesday, you might be smiling more than average. By Friday, you wouldn't feel a single thing. That's how quick we adapt to them. It's crazy, but, uh, but absolutely unaddictive. In fact, most people that do it don't want to do it again, you know, for at least for quite a while. Uh, and if you do, you know, there might be something, something wrong there because <laughs> the current laws about these mushrooms, they're federally illegal, considered a schedule one drug. Uh, schedule one drugs are substances or chemicals which are defined as drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse which is kind of crazy that they put, put them in here. Michael Buke told me that this happened in the 1970s. Richard Nixon did it because mushrooms were making people too nice and it was affecting the war effort in Vietnam. So they put them as a Schedule One drug with heroin, LSD, marijuana, peyote. Uh, recently, Oregon voters passed the 2020 Oregon ballot measure 109, making it uh, the first state to both decriminalize psilocybin and also legalize it for therapeutic use. So they're making big steps there to try to harness the power of these mushrooms and use them in a responsible way. So we're going a long ways from like getting high to like getting healed, you know, and it's cool. You know, something this powerful could be used in a positive way is really, really cool. So Oregon's uh, on the on the forefront of that, Colorado's close behind. Seattle, of course, is close behind, whatever Oregon seems to do. Um, yeah, cities in Washington, like Seattle and Port Townsend have decriminalized them, but that's like on a city level, you know, so it's lowest priority. So I guess the cops aren't gonna go after you, or if they, if they find some magic mushrooms in your possession, they're probably just gonna look the other way. So that's my presentation for today, and thank you all for coming out, and I'll, I'll take some questions after. How quickly do you see blue, blue bruising? And uh, I, I think within about 20 minutes to 30 minutes, it's not, it's not instantaneous, like, um, uh, like a butter bleed. If you're to cut that in half, you could just sit and watch it turn blue before your eyes. But psilocybe mushrooms, not so much. But, so it takes a little bit. Uh, that a uh, friend of yours, uh, I forgot his name. He looks familiar. Is he a, a friend by any chance of a dude from a head with a thick Detroit accent and a? Yeah, yeah. Alan yeah. Rockefeller is. Yeah, he's I'm a. Like, a crime pays, but Bonnie crime pays, but Bonnie doesn't. doesn't. Yeah. So yeah, Alan is really well known in the mycological community, and he just did a talk at the coast about psilocybin mushrooms of North America, which I had the pleasure of filming and uploading onto my YouTube channel, a little shameless plug for Mushroom Wonderland. So check that out if you want to hear Alan Rockefeller. He travels all over the world looking at these kind of mushrooms and studying, so super interesting. Do you have a video about how like this is a little brown mushroom and then this is not a little brown mushroom sort of comparison? Well, yeah, I think a little brown mushroom covers a lot of a lot of types of mushrooms, but um, I actually made a video last year that was Psilocybe polliculosa versus Gallerina marginata. So Gallerina is a deadly mushroom, and Psilocybe polliculosa is a hallucinogenic mushroom that people are trying to eat. These two are growing right next to each other. So I made a video about the dangers and how to differentiate the two, and that was the one warning that I've got from YouTube. They said that that's dangerous content, so I was like, okay, well, I, I thought it was probably a lot of harm reduction. It was probably one of the more useful videos, you know, because people are gonna go out and pick these regardless, so it's better to be safe and knowledgeable, in my opinion. Are there any studies on uh, how long it takes psilocin to degrade out of your system? That's a good question. Are there any studies about how long it takes for psilocin to get out of your system? Um, 
I don't even know. Do, like, are you talking about for like a urinalysis test or something like that, or like? I mean, like you said, the tolerance can. Oh, oh, gotcha. Really high. You know, I don't know that. I, I would love to pontificate, but I'm not gonna because uh, I don't know. But that is interesting. So, yeah, thanks for that question. I'm gonna look it up. So. Okay. Yeah, way in the back. What colors? print with the gallerinas have. So gallerina is like a really, um, it's a, a brown, brownish orange spore print. So um, that one, yeah, it's a, it's kind of a, a lighter brown color. And uh, the gallerina are probably the most commonly confused. So as far as like lookalikes, um, gallerina is a concern here because it likes to grow on wood mulch just like Psilocybe cyanescens. They can grow near each other, and uh, but it's not going to have that dark purple brown spore print and it's not going to bruise blue and it's not going to have the removable gelatinous pellicle. So if you compare everything against those three criteria, you're going to be safe. Thank you. Yeah, those uh, gallerinas, those are also really, really commonly misidentified in mushroom forms too. So sometimes people will find them and they'll post them and then they're misidentified. Yeah, yeah. And then there, there is that threat, you know, and that's one thing about <coughs> online identification forums is you got some people just spouting things they have no idea what they're talking about and it can be dangerous that way, you know, so. How do we find your YouTube uh, presentation? So just go on YouTube.com and look up the words Mushroom Wonderland and uh, like my hat. And uh, <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of videos. There's, you know, 120 different videos. I, I do a lot of foraging mainly of wild edible mushrooms and just everyday mushrooms and all kinds of uses for mushrooms. So this is a small sliver about what I talk about, but it just felt like a topic that should be covered here. So. Can you forage for edibles all year round? Absolutely. You know, you just got to find where it's moist enough, but all year I've been finding mushrooms, even with the long extended dry summer, you can find little micro habitats, little small climates where the moisture is right and fungus finds a way, you know. So oyster mushrooms grow all year round on, on downed logs, you know, super easy one to identify and find. So if you're into foraging wild edible mushrooms, yeah, they're, they're out here. But sometimes, you know, like David said, he's got about a dozen mushrooms. If you want to forage all year round, you might have to expand that number a little bit, you know. But there's a lot of good edible mushrooms out here. Have you noticed with the heat that the availability of mushrooms has really changed over the last couple of years. Yeah, it's weird. It seems like uh, you know all the all the months have like shifted back a month or something. So um, it's weird. I think we're we're finally going to have an explosion of mushrooms. It's happening right now, but we're looking at freezing temperatures coming up, which mushrooms don't care for that much. But again, we live in a coniferous kind of environment. And there's a lot of micro habitats and that hard frost is what really is gonna slow things down. I think we're gonna be fine through Christmas. We're gonna be finding tons of mushrooms out here. Things kind of slow down in January, but you know, even this last winter, I kept picking mushrooms all the way up until morel season, which is spring. So there's always something out there to find. All right, any more questions? We're gonna get ready for Daniel Winkler. He's a famous mycologist and author. He's out here selling books and stuff, and he gives a really cool talk all about wild edible mushrooms, fruits of the forest. So thank you all very much.